I'm delighted to be back in Oslo and thrilled to see such a large crowd. And I gather there's, there's more upstairs. Hello, upstairs. And uh, uh, so without further ado, let me begin. This is one of my favorite cartoons. Uh, <laughs> and uh, of course, in particular, we get why. And in the end, why me, but why? The difference between the dog and the, ma and the man in this picture is what I'm going to be talking about and how it came about and what it means, what's the importance of it. Uh, and as Neil said, this is Darwin year, and so it's going to be a talk about Darwin. Here's a question that I'm going to be uh, approaching. What were reasons before anybody asked why? Were there reasons? before anybody asked why. Now the old answer is this, surely God has his reasons, God works in mysterious ways, but that won't do anymore. So we go back to the question, what were reasons before anybody asked why? Now, yes, I know. <laughs> I, I don't know why I get this reaction. Maybe, maybe this explains why I get invited to give so many lectures in Darwin. Here. But it's actually all just accidental. Uh, uh, as I told somebody the other day, I was actually setting out to look like Rasputin. And then, and then I got older, and it just happened this way. In any case, why was Darwin's idea such a great idea? And the answer is very simple. And also, I think, very profound. Darwin, unlike any other scientific idea, unlike any other philosophical idea, his idea united the world of purposeless causation with the world of meaning. You go all the way from physics to, to ethics and to poetry, all in a single unified perspective. It is the most unifying idea that anybody's ever had. And the realms that it unifies are stunningly different. Now, it's not that there wasn't a pre-Darwinian worldview which had a certain wonderful unity to it. And it's very familiar to us from, for instance, the Sistine Chapel and the central panel where Michelangelo shows God putting the finishing touches on his most magnificent creation, Adam. Well, this we might call the trickle-down theory of creation. It takes a big, fancy, wonderful, stupendously wonderful thing to make a slightly less wonderful thing. And this is an idea that I think in some regards may have been around even before Homo sapiens. Even some of our ancestors, Homo habilis, the handyman, may have had some dim appreciation of the fact that it takes a big, fancy thing. He had, Homo habilis made simple flaked stone tools, for instance. Uh, uh, Take, you never see a, a, a pot making a potter. You never see a horseshoe making a blacksmith. It's always smart, wonderful things making rather lesser things. That's the trickle-down theory. And so, it seems, until we get the bubble-up theory of creation, and that's Darwin's theory. Now, here, I'm not going to read all of this. You can read it. In fact, this is right at the end of uh, chapter four of Origin of Species. And here in a single paragraph is, is, is the theory. And I'm just going to draw attention to the fact that there is a very straightforward argument here, which we can just read together. Um, if beings vary at all, and if there be a severe struggle for life, then if variations useful to any organic being do occur, Assuredly, individuals thus characterized will have the best chance of being preserved in the struggle for life, and from the strong principle of inheritance, they will tend to produce offspring similarly characterized. This principle of preservation I have called for the sake of brevity, natural selection. There it is. That's the idea. It's really stunningly simple on the face of it, and yet people often discover that its implications are very hard to get their heads around and very hard to, uh, uh, to accept. 
And an early critic of Darwin summed this up in a, in a passage I love to read uh, because it is uh, well, so full of passion. And this is from a man named Mackenzie. It was published in the Athenaeum, which was sort of like the New York Review of Books of its day, uh, a, a, a very central intellectual magazine. In the theory with which we have to deal, absolute ignorance is the artificer. So that we may enunciate as the fundamental principle of the whole system that in order to make a perfect and beautiful machine, it is not requisite to know how to make it. He put the capital letters in on the original. <laughs> this proposition will be found on careful examination to express in condensed form the essential purport of the theory and to express in a few words all Mr. Darwin's meaning, who by a strange inversion of reasoning seems to think absolute ignorance fully qualified to take the place of absolute wisdom in all the achievements of creative skill. Yes, exactly. He's got it. That is right, and it is a strange inversion of reasoning. He's got it. A creationist pamphlet has the following amusing page in it. Do you know of any building that didn't have a builder? Do you know of any painting that didn't have a painter? Do you know of any car that didn't have a maker? If you answered yes for any of the above, give details. Ha <laughs> ha! Take that, you evolutionist. <laughs> and yet, and yet, that is what Darwin's saying, and it's this fact that is so hard for people to get their heads around and to accept. Because it's clear that you never see a car without a maker. You never see a painting without a painter. And yet here's Darwin claiming otherwise. Now another one of my heroes is Alan Turing, another brilliant Brit. And I want to draw attention to his own strange inversion of reasoning and show you the similarities. Now here's a picture of computers before Turing. Most of them are wearing dresses. They're people. Computer, that was a job description. That was a job you had. What do you do for a living? I'm a computer. Uh, they were hired by the thousands, actually, uh, before, uh, before Turing. To do what? Well, to do computational work. In those days, computers had to understand arithmetic. In fact, they were typically math majors. They had to appreciate the reasons why they were doing what they were doing. And Turing recognized this was not strictly necessary. This was his great inversion. Let's look at the two together. Here's Darwin's. In order to make a perfect and beautiful machine, it is not requisite to know how to make it. Here's Turing's. In order to be a perfect and beautiful computing machine, it is not requisite to know what arithmetic is. Hmm. Two very similar, in fact, I think they're the same inversion at a very deep level. And what they have in common is that both of them draw our attention to something that we would have thought maybe would have thought was impossible, and that is competence without comprehension. This is my bumper sticker now for this idea. Competence without comprehension. In the case of Darwin, he's saying. The process of natural selection has and needs no comprehension, and it is competent to produce all of this fantastic living stuff. Turing is saying, you can have the competence to do not just arithmetic, but anything that arithmetic enables, and you don't have to understand it at all. The implication of this is that understanding or comprehension, mind, consciousness, intention, it's not the cause, it's an effect, and a fairly recent effect at that. That's a strange inversion, and it is something that if you understand it, you understand, I think, both Darwin and Turing together much better. <laughs>